Okay. Half of you here know me. Half of you don't. Uh, the ones that know me had me for database. Congratulations. You got me again. Um, so, welcome to CST8102. Uh, it's basically uh, Computer Essentials command line via Linux. Uh, except there's no malware business. Uh, so none of that crap. What are you going to learn this? Well, actually, I'll give you guys a bit of a background on me for those of you that don't know who I am. I am a, my name is Dan Goudreau, and Slideshow is not doing anything. There we go. My name is Dan Goudreau. Uh, I respond to Dan, Daniel, Professor, whatever. I'm not really picky on how you address me. Um, I can be reached by email. Uh, since I'm, you know, part-time prof, that means that I don't have a phone. So, those that have had me know I do respond to emails, and usually pretty quickly. Uh, I've had students go, holy crap, do you ever sleep? Uh, no. And you think I'm kidding. Um, so, the, basically put, I work full-time outside of teaching. Uh, I work for a company that writes software. And they're one of two web developers they've got. Um, I'm a professional web developer by trade. Um, database architect, database administrator. I set up web servers. I write web apps. I, I do front end development. I do it all. So I've got a wide range of experience, uh, except with Java. Don't ever ask me for help with Java, because you're out of luck. Uh, last time I looked at Java was to help a student over their problem, and I had no idea what the code was saying. And then I discovered the student also didn't know what the code was saying, so that was all good. We were working at the same level at that point. Now, um, those of you that have had me know what kind of person I am. Marginally sarcastic. Uh, don't give me anything to work with. And uh, the ones that had me with my Tuesday lectures really don't know how bad it can be when you have me on a, for a full-sized group. Um, I will pick on you and pretty much everyone equally. Don't feel bad. Um, that's just how I am. Uh, that means you're allowed to pick on me too, within reason. Uh, there's lines I won't cross, and I'll let you know when you cross my line. Now, talk about the course itself. Okay, it's two hours of lecture a week, two hours of lab a week, um, there, and there's a, one hour of hybrid a week. The To do the basic arrangement of how all this is set up is Here's, here goes. There are no assignments in this class. Labs are the only assignments you have. There are two tests. I've been told they're taken in class. So they're not take-home tests. I'm sorry, guys, that have had me in the past. But they're, it's, they're fairly straightforward. I've got the old examples of the old tests, and it's not like some of the decision-making need to make on database-like courses. Um, and there's an exam. Now I'm pulling these numbers off the top of my head, but if I remember correctly, the final exam is worth 30%. Labs are worth 40%. Tests, if I recall right, are 10% each, and then the hybrids are 10%. Uh, that is all on the course outline, which is attached to Blackboard for this course section, so that you should be all good there. Um, the CSI is up. As most of you know, CSI is our suggestion, not a rule of law. This is when we plan to do stuff, and this is how we plan to do it. Um, again, the CSI is on Blackboard. It's fairly easy to read. Go through it, see what there is to see. Um, because of last term's kerfluffle, this term is one week shorter. But there is a final exam. You don't get off of it the second term. Um, and a few other policies of my own. As you can see, I have a camera up front. I will do my best to record my lectures every week for everybody's review and pleasure. Um, we'll see how this goes, because I've never caught, taught this course before, so it could be an interesting set of recordings, just to be totally honest. Uh, doesn't mean I don't know the course material, it's just I've never taught it before. So there's, it's going to be interesting. By interesting, I mean it's going to be interesting, like the you know the Chinese proverb. 
Um, my lab attendance policy is I don't care if you come to lab. Honestly. I don't take attendance in lab. And the good news is I have all my lab sections for this lecture. And by the size of the group of students I have, it doesn't look like the lab sections are particularly huge either. So after the first week or two, I'll be posting my lab times for the other sections, like for all, for all of you, so you guys can start floating around with whatever lab works for you. Um, the labs need to be handed in on a weekly basis, except for the weeks where you have a test. Um, theoretically, you could probably get away with, if you really decide to bear down and go for it, you could probably blow through the first six labs using Google. Just saying. You could Google your way through the first six labs. Um, so, if you happen to get all ten labs done nice and early in the term, I'll grade them and you're done. Congratulations. You just have to show up for tests. Is there value to coming to the labs? Yes. A few different reasons. Uh, one, if you get stuck. Two, if you nuke your computer, or at least your VM. Uh, three, you give me someone to have a conversation with, because I've had empty labs before. Keep me company. Um, you know, that kind of thing. All right, so, and the hybrids are due right before the end of the term. It's under the hybrid section. You're allowed to do them whenever you want. It comes with lessons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this course is actually really structured and organized because somebody else gave me the course content. It doesn't look like my normal type of courses. And not that my courses aren't organized, it's just a totally different layout than my usual stuff. But the hybrid work is all there. I do recommend you do them sooner than later. Unlike 8215 people who were, did not do their hybrids, and for them would have been the difference between a B and an A, you should do your hybrids. Now, um, hybrids. There's two tests. They're in class. They're on the CSI. Um, they're multiple guess. Scantron, apparently. So you don't get your grades instantly. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I can get away with not having it Scantron and just doing it on Blackboard. I'm still getting permission from the course coordinator to do it. Such as life, Feisty if he says no. Textbooks. Don't download them. You're not going to use them. The course coordinator's been trying to get them taken off the CS, uh, the course outline for two years now. He takes them off, they re magically reappear. However, that having been said, there's one called Operating Systems Fundamentals or Essentials or whatever. Uh, I looked at the two tests. I don't have the final exam, but I looked at the two tests. There was one question on two tests that came out of that textbook. And if you have a somewhat competent brain, you'd be able to guess what the right answer is even without the book. So don't, definitely don't download that book. The other book is a Linux command line reference. It's okay. It's not bad. It's not as good as Stack Overflow. So, honestly, we now put, made the books as recommended reads, not required. Even though the damn course outline says required, you don't need them. And which leads me to the last bit of what I'm going to be doing this term with you guys is I hate slideshows. I'm going to do this one because this one's full of text and noise. So I'm going to be doing today's slideshow. After this week, it'll be up to you to look at the slideshow before class. That's going to be your assigned reading. About a 25 screen slideshow. What I'm going to be doing is I'll be flipping the normal way this course is done. I'll be doing what's called demonstrative lectures. Demonstrative lectures means I'm going to sit down here and discuss what's on those slides while I demonstrate what these things actually do. While being recorded, so therefore you guys go, oh, I remember Dan talked about this. How did he do that? And you can go to the YouTube channel and go pull up the lecture and actually see what the hell I typed in all three times I got it wrong. But that having been said, that is how I'm going to do these lectures, which is another reason why I don't take attendance, is because I'm going to be recording this stuff 
You know, it helps if you come, if you have questions, and then if you see me type something weird and you're wondering why I'm doing that, you can ask for clarification. That's why you can actually come to the lectures. However, by the same token, if you're sick and you're contagious, and you just finished expelling your lung out in the hall, don't come to class to make the rest of us sick. But lots of us have been exposed to all kinds of germs, and we've all been, it's been apparently, according to several sources, this year's set of colds are some of the worst in years. They stick around forever. Therefore, I'd rather you stayed home and not make everybody else sick. The lectures are usually up within a day a day or two. Um, so normally even if you don't come to class, you'll have the stuff you need to do the labs. And on we go to the wall of text. Okay, you guys are gonna be learning Linux this term. Linux is a Unix-like operating system. By now, hopefully you guys know what an operating system is. What is an operating system? The software for your computer that lets you interact with the hardware. It's basically your butler between you and your computer. It shuffles files around. It deletes the crap you don't want deleted. It does all that nice stuff. However, what's different about Linux as opposed to pretty much every other operating system is that Linux is free and open. It's open source. There's Thousands of people constantly contributing to Linux. And you can, be, you can download the code, modify it, change it, package back up, and redistribute it to your heart's content. It was designed by a guy called Linus Torvalds. I'm assuming I, I never could pronounce his last name properly. Um, he was 20 years old when he did this. And essentially, he started as a hobby in the 1990s. And the problem is that he looked around at the operating systems that were out there, and he didn't like any of them. Essentially, he looked at the commercial Unix systems. He says, those are great. Nobody's going to pay 10 grand for a license to run it on their computer. He looked at Windows. Now, think about this. This is early 1990s, so this is pre-Windows 95. We're talking Windows 3.1, if you're lucky. Or Windows 3.11 for work groups, if you're really lucky and you're at the cutting edge of technology. And he goes, this is terrible. He also looked at one called BSD. And anybody here running a Mac? Congratulations, you're running BSD. You won't be able to do most of the work for this class on it. The commands are different. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying. Um, he looked at BSD. BSD was great. BSD was really uh, the hardware requirements for it were strange and unique. Therefore, he said, well, this isn't really what I want. So he wanted to make it a 3D6, 46 compatible OS. In other words, a 32-bit operating system. And essentially, he wanted to make sure it was free. That was his goal in life. Now, ever since then, strange things happened. Linux took over the internet, literally. Somewhere along the way, somebody says, holy crap, it's free. I don't need to give Sun, IBM, SCO, um, you know, digital, and other companies here that make Unix licenses. I don't need to pay for $10,000 computers and a $20,000 software license so I can pre prepare a web server. I can get a free piece of software and run it on my piece of crap that's heating my bedroom. And then I can connect a modem to it, and people can surf the internet off my computer. By modem, I'm talking about the ones that actually dialed up on your phone line. And it grew. Um, in my third year of college, Linux Slackware 1.0 came out. That was the first distribution of Linux. It came on 27 floppies. It took four days to download. Uh, it also destroyed my laptop the three times I tried to install it, because I didn't understand anything. I knew Windows inside and out. I couldn't understand what the heck all these bits and pieces were. Um, I'm glad it wasn't my laptop. It was a rental from the school. But, you know, it was an experience and a half. And then I was, off, I was offered a job as a network administrator at a hospital where they were using actually Linux at a hospital 
version one of Linux to do their network interconnects. Why? Because hospitals have budgets and they chose to use Linux to do their interconnects. Uh, they were one of the first adopters of. Now, to this day, Linux is still in charge of the Linux kernel. And I'll be talking about that in a few minutes, what the kernel is. Um, however, essentially, he guides the beating heart of Linux. Not the UI, not most of the tools you're using, the core part of Linux. And he decides what gets put in, what doesn't get put in. He's basically ruling it with an iron fist. Uh, if anybody here has ever looked up at some of his commit histories, some of the words he uses are not nice. Um, he has been known to say, what the fudge doodle is this for? What the F is wrong with you? He's that kind of guy. However, he also believes F stands for free, effing free. So what's happened is he controls the core of Linux, lets everybody else do whatever the heck they want outside of it. It's kind of cool. Um, it's almost like what's starting to happen inside Windows. The core part is still controlled by Microsoft, but lots of parts of Windows now are actually much more open than they used to be. And because whoever's in charge of, um, actually whoever's in charge of development at Microsoft now has decided Linux might have the right idea. So everybody's going the same path. It just took some people longer than others. So essentially, when you combine the pieces that Linux is concerned about to the rest of the rest of the world, the bits and pieces that people put on, it becomes a distribution. And essentially, I'll talk about that in a minute, also what a distribution is. Now, a bit more history. It was designed for 386 computers. Uh, odds are only those of us with gray hair remember 386 computers. Some of you with less gray hair may remember 486 computers or Pentiums. This is how far back this goes. Um, it ran okay. We had eight megs of RAM. You know, your phone takes bigger pictures than the amount of RAM we had in our computers. So it ran okay. But now it runs on absolutely everything. By the way, how many of you have Android phones? Okay, yeah? You're running Linux. Android's Linux. It actually runs the Linux kernel inside. It runs on absolutely everything. And just to show that this slide's actually really dated, because this has actually been handed down through like a series of teachers after years after years, it talks about smartphones, right? Alpha processors. Alpha processors haven't been sold in seven years, eight years. Uh, they, were, they were created by a company called Digital Equipment Equipment. They were based here, the company was based here in Ottawa. One of their offices was here in Ottawa, the development of these processors. Best friggin' processors on earth, then Compaq bought them and promptly killed it because Intel told them to. Because Intel started giving Compaq CPUs for free. So we'll give you CPUs for free if you buy this pro company and kill it. So uh, Mac, Power Mac, Spark, these are all processor architectures that you know, pretty much don't exist anymore. However, you'll still find some of these, especially like the Sparks and stuff, in the big development firms where they do a lot of 3D rendering. Um, but essentially, it runs on Intel-compatible processors because that's pretty much all that's left. And it runs on ARM processors. Those are the phones and your Raspberry Pis and your various other and sundry pieces of equipment, network routers, that kind of stuff. Okay, those of you that have seen it know the Linux mascot's a penguin. I have no idea why, but everybody, everything that's open source must have an animal mascot. And apparently penguin is it for this. It released in version 0 .01, surprise. And it was released in 1991. And the version 1.0 of the kernel was released in 1994. I downloaded it in 1995. And like I said, I promptly killed my laptop repeatedly. Um, it is currently what they call GPL'd. GPL means it's an open license. You're allowed to download, modify, change, redistribute your heart's content as long as it, A, you don't charge money for it. B, any changes you do have to be given back into the community. Share and share alike. 
Um, basically put as much links in here. I did update the slide, so I apparently currently have the most up-to-date slide. Uh, the current version is 4.14.13 as of January 10th. What does that mean for you guys? It means absolutely nothing. It just means that the latest version of the kernel is this. It doesn't mean what version of Ubuntu you're running or what version of CentOS or whatever you're running. It just means the engine inside of it is version 4. Now, Linux is packaged for different uses and distributions. So depending on what you're trying to do, you download different distributions. Essentially, what distributions are is it's a kernel which is what Linux is concerned about, plus a bunch of extra packages, bits and pieces that make up the OS. Anybody here ever see somebody assemble a kit car? One, two, okay. For those of you that know, don't know what a kit car is, is you order a kit for a car, they give you a set of parts you can order, and you basically put your car together yourself. The only thing you really don't let get a lot of control over usually is the motor itself. They give you a motor. Linux is the same way. It's like a kit car. You can choose to put on whatever wheels, whatever body frame you want, what kind of seats you want into it, what kind of steering wheel, what kind of display dash you have. You don't get to pick the motor. So everybody can have a car that looks completely different, but they're all running the same motor and powertrain. And depending on what you're trying to achieve, there are server distributions and desktop distributions. They serve different purposes, obviously. Um, every year for the last 10 years has been the year of Linux on the desktop. And it hasn't happened yet. Um, it's, it is what it is. The Linux des desktops are pretty good. Uh, when you go through the labs, you're going to end up installing Ubuntu. And it's going to be the Ubuntu desktop edition. That means you get the full GUI, which you're not going to use at all. But, you know, you can get the full GUI for your uh, purple enjoyment, because they like orange and purple in that distribution. Or you can get a server one, which has absolutely no graphical interface at all. So Ubuntu server, for example, has no graphical interface at all, command line only. It also requires about half the, half the hardware to run. Um, there are other distributions that are somewhere in between, such as CentOS. CentOS is a open source version of Red Hat Enterprise. Red Hat Enterprise is not free. Just a bunch of different versions of Linux. Imagine if, you know, you have Windows on your machine, but there's actually like 150 different versions of Windows, and you pick the one that looks the prettiest to your eye. That's essentially what Linux is like, which is why it's never taken over the desktop. Because you could say, well, you know, what kind of car do you like? And I could guarantee in here that I could name out any given brand of car, and there won't be an entire room that says, oh, I like Lattice. And nobody likes Lattice. Russian cars, they're terrible. They rust before they even get delivered to the showroom. But I could say, well, who likes Mazdas? Who likes BMWs? Who likes Fords? Who likes Mitsus? You know. And everybody, well, different people raise their hands at different times because you're looking for different things in your cars. And each of the distributions offers you different things. Ubuntu tends to be one of the easiest ones to use because they aimed for ease of use. That's the target they were going for. And it's not bad. It's somewhere like if Mac OS and Windows had a love child that needs training wheels all the time. It's good most of the time and every once in a while the training wheel falls off and it hits its face in the concrete. But, you know, that's pretty much the description of every operating system. This one just seems to hit the face a little harder than others. Most distributions are free to download. Knock yourself out if you want to try more than one. They'll all work for these labs. Fedora is Red Hat, what used to be called Red Hat, Fedora now. OpenSUSE, Debian Slackware, Arch Linux, Ubuntu, blah, 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 CentOS. Last time I checked, there was over 100 distributions. I think there are like 155 or something. It's ridiculous, the volume of distributions. But for this course, we're going to try to standardize on one. So we'll all brainwash you into using Ubuntu. Uh, why? Because it's the easiest one to install. You literally click, 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 and it's done. 
So to install Linux, you pick a distribution. <coughs> Essentially, it's an installer, a kernel, and a bunch of packages. They actually have the same stuff inside. What they're doing is they're customizing the user experience. So under the, under the, the polish, the insides are almost all the same. So if you don't even care about the polish, that's what I'm saying, you can pretty much do any Linux distribution for this course, and it'll be fine. It's just a case of which one do you want to use and which one makes you feel happy. Uh, if you choose to use a headless one, congratulations, you're a masochist. But, you know, that's all we use at work are headless versions of Linux on our servers. And we run 26 Linux servers, so, you know, no GUI to be seen anywhere. <coughs> no, but yeah. Sometimes you have to accept the pain. Because um, those that are used to working in Windows land or in Mac are used to going, I need to change this. Click, click, click. Type, type, type. Because you can't find it. <coughs> click. Oh, there we go. My Wi-Fi is enabled. On Linux, on the other hand, you've now spent the last 10 minutes typing. But you can also now set a cron job that turns your Wi-Fi on and off magically. So, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do. <coughs> um, the biggest dist difference between distributions, like I said, it's the bells and whistles and how the bits and pieces get assembled together. Um, different operating systems have different package managers. Windows has a package manager. Some of you may not know. Right? It's called the Windows Store. That's actually a package manager. Mac has a package manager, unfortunately. Um, it's called the Apple Store. And it sometimes works the way it should. Um, Linux, of course, because it's all about free and do whatever you want, have about 10 different package managers. And each operating system, each uh, distribution has one that they like. Ubuntu uses something called apt. Apt is back from back in the days from an old operating system called Debian and it works great. It's like magic most of the time except for when it doesn't work. But it usually works. 95% of the time it works. That last 5% kind of sucks hard. Um, all the Red Hat derived ones use something called yum and you go yum, space install, space whatever you want to install, and stuff happens. And that one's a little more painful because it doesn't always grab all the bits and pieces it needs. So you spend a lot of time going, why is this not working? Um, Arch Linux, you go, I don't remember what the package is called. I think it's called Archie. You go Archie, space, whatever. Then it downloads source code, and then you wait the next two hours while it actually compiles the software for you. So it's optimized for your computer. That's how Arch Linux works. So that's the, the distributions. Um, what are the big differences between the different ones? As I said earlier, interfaces are different. Which packages get installed different? The administration tools are always different. Uh, the, the biggest tweak, though, is the optimization of the kernel. Even though they all use the same kernel, you can tweak how your kernel behaves, what drivers are included in it, which ones aren't included in it. That's one of the cute tricks about Linux is you install the operating system and 95% to 98% of the hardware out there works on it on the first go. Unlike when you install Windows, even Windows 10 is pretty darn good now. You install Windows and then you just let it sit for three or four hours while it downloads drivers and installs them. Most hardware just works out of the box with Linux. Um, the most notorious one that didn't used to work were Wi-Fi cards. Go figure. Uh, because none of the manufacturers make drivers for Linux. So they, everybody had to make their own, and it sucked. Yeah. Yeah, that's the video cards manufacturer's fault. Because they don't like sharing what the little video cards are doing on the inside. Uh, NVIDIA is really, really bad for that. AMD is marginally better. It's too bad AMD stuff sucks. AMD is good at the software, sucks at the hardware. NVIDIA's hardware is great, sucks at the software. Take your poison. Or you just be a man or a woman. Take your pick. Got to be careful how I word that. And you go buy yourself a Matrox card and everything works like magic. And they still make cards. They still do. 
for workstations. So, but they work good for servers because there's no GUI. <laughs> okay, Linux is multi-user. What does that mean? That means many people can be using it at the same time. Unlike Windows, where what are the odds of two people using Windows at the same time and it actually survive? There's a version of Windows that allows that. The amount of hardware it requires is insane. Windows Terminal Server. I'm not going to talk about Mac. Mac does well when you get through the first user. I'm just teasing. I hate Macs. <laughs> Don't take it personally. I just pick on Macs relentlessly. Um, they're actually really good hardware. It's just too bad the policy of the company sucks. But, you know, the software is good. Uh, it's a multi-user operating system. That means lots of people can use it at the same time. People can log in, use it independently. And depending on how your software is set up, you can actually connect remotely and run graphical tools on a different computer. Uh, I will actually, I can actually demonstrate that not too long before this is done, just show you guys that it can be done. Um, it's multi-process multitasking, just like Windows. That means you can run more than one program at a time. And it does just about as well as anything else can. It has preemptive multitasking. It's got background processes. Everybody gets a slice of the pie and everybody tries to share nicely. Theoretically, it's supposed to multitask better than Windows. Uh, the jury's still out on that. Multiprocessor. It allows you to run multiple processors on any given system. Now, by today's standards, that sounds like a really stupid statement because odds are there's no one in this room that doesn't have a multi-core computer. Each core is technically a processor. What this is saying, though, is you can have multiple sockets on the motherboard, and Linux knows what to do with it also. Uh, with Windows, you've got to pay, pay for special versions of Windows to use multiple sockets. Uh, Windows 10 Enterprise, Windows 10, certain versions of Pro will do it. But there's actually special versions of Windows for multiprocessor, multi-core. Multi-core, yes, multiprocessor is a little sketchy. Um, so... What makes up the operating system? There's a kernel. Like I said before, that's the engine of the operating system. It's what controls the software talking to the hardware. It's basically the translator for all the software so it knows how to talk to the hardware. Modules. The modules that make it up, those are device drivers. And either they're loadable modules or they're built into the, comp to the kernel. Doesn't mean a whole lot to you guys. That's fine. If you ever get into operating system to level where that you care about that, congratulations. Um, this is the last first and last time you'll actually hear this in this course. But essentially, it's saying that you can choose how your drivers are installed. Just like you have a car, you can choose which parts you bolt onto the engine and which parts you can put on whenever you want. It's a bit like you can have a turbo switch that you can actually turn the turbo on and off on your engine using a switch inside the inside the car. Is it part of the engine or not? Uh, daemons. Daemons are applications or processes used to supply user with required services. Now, essentially, daemons are the same thing as what's called a service in Windows. If you guys don't know what services are and you got through the database course, because I know at least a lot of my groups, I had at least 15% of the students that didn't know why their Postgres wasn't running. And then what did Dan do? He'd do this. And go to services and go, which one here is not running? Windows has services. Linux has daemons. They're the same thing. Basically put their background processes. Their background processes that run all the time. It provides services to the front end. What are some background processes you'd find? Audio. Um... File system access, database, security, uh, web servers, tunneling agents, those kinds of things. Those are all part of what would run in the background. In Linux, there are tons of processes that run in the background all the time. Uh, the networking stack is a daemon. It loads, runs, and connects you to a network. 
the web servers are running in the background. They start at boot time, and they run the entire time the operating system is running in the background like good little backstage workers. If anybody's ever been part of a production of a play or a band event or, you know, they're the roadies. They're running around in the back. Nobody really notices they're there. Shit gets done. That's what they're for. And then there's applications. What are applications? Do you guys know what applications are? Word processors are applications. Web browsers are applications. It just so happens that in Linux, applications can have no interface. Command line applications only, if you choose to. Those include text editors such as VI or Emacs. Or you also got text-based web browsers. Really cool experience if you've never done that before. While surfing the internet with no JavaScript and no images. It's like it's nothing you've ever seen. Fastest load times ever. All kinds of applications, graphical design tools, all kinds of stuff. So essentially, once you pick a distribution, you get all these bits and pieces. Okay. An application manager helps to install software. RPM, yum, apt, which is Debian's. Uh, comes with something called X Windows. X Windows provides the graphical interface. Well, it allows you to actually use buttons and windows and click stuff around. X Windows has been around for 30 years. It's special. Essentially, it's a distributed network protocol graphical interface. What does that mean? It means that you can launch the application on one computer and actually display it on a different computer. You're you establish a connection to the source computer, and you instead of saying, oh, display it on your screen, show it on mine. Boop. There you go. And though some of you are thinking, well, you can do that with Windows, with like Team Viewer or Remote Desktop. Remote Desktop is the closest thing you're going to get to this. This is not like Team Viewer or GoToMeeting or any of those things. It literally runs the interface on your screen. It's not being passed through something else. It's literally on your screen. Uh, includes tools, utilities, and add-ons. <coughs> tools and utilities fall under the category of command line tools. The cool thing about uh, Linux is you can choose which command line tools you have in each distribution. You can add some on in case you're missing stuff. How many of you are old enough to remember DOS? Hot damn. I don't feel quite that old. Okay. <sighs> I remember CPM. Yeah. The, yeah, great OS. Way better than DOS. But, you know, some of us remember certain things we wish we could forget. But DOS, do you guys remember the commands from DOS, CD, DIR, RM, or so, no, Dell, sorry. These commands. <coughs> Essentially, those are command line tools. Linux has tons of them. More and more and more. There's so many, it's absurd. But there's a tool for everything. It's like a Swiss Army knife, the big one. Now, <coughs> where are people picking Linux OS? There's no licensing requirements. You install it and you use it. You don't pay a fee. You don't have to report to anyone. You don't have to explain anything to anyone. No ongoing fees. There's large, large support groups. Uh, essentially, there's, if you need help with your Linux install, there's probably a group out there that can help you. It's pretty cool. That's a community. Um, there's a documentation project, which is known as LDP. Usenet, for those of you that remember what Usenet is. Um, the only people that use Usenet nowadays are people pirating things because they're trying to avoid torrent sites. And they're still tracking those sites, those things too, so you're not off the hook. Uh, the local area Linux user groups. Ottawa has four Linux user groups. If you ever want to walk into a room and feel superior to people, they're not going to make you feel superior. Because they're probably a lot smarter than you, but they probably smell a lot worse than you. So you're going to go in there, it's going to be mixed feelings. 
I'm kidding, okay? Most of those guys in there are actually pretty damn fit. That last one I went to, I felt kind of pudgy, so, you know, and I came in there right after a lecture wearing a shirt and tie, and I felt kind of out of place. It was a really strange sensation, but that used to be the outlook of how people looked at Linux users. Is he lives in his mother's basement eating Cheetos. But, you know, uh, Linux also supports pretty much all major hardware. There's very few things that it doesn't support. And even these acronyms here are so far out of date, they're absurd. The only ones really you need to worry about is USB and PCI Express. Uh, AGP has been dead for oh, 16 years. <laughs> I had an AGP computer. Video card goes into that. Wow. 3D. PCMCIA used to be a slot on the side of your laptop. You plug stuff into there. Now it's been replaced with them called M2. You plug hard drives and peripherals into M2. It's basically direct, direct to bus. SCSI. Uh, SCSI is great. Uh, really expensive. You want really fast hard drives? That's the way to go. But now they've replaced that with a, a bunch of other things, such as uh, SAS drives and whatnot. But it supports pretty much every piece of hardware that's been released in the last 20 years. You have an old beater computer that's gathering dust in the basement? You can install Linux on that, it'll probably run. You don't want to install necessarily one of the graphically heavy ones, but it'll run. It will coexist well with other operating systems. Um, you can dual boot, you can use a VM, you can have them side by side. Be warned, depending on what kind of computer you have, you may have some challenges trying to do a dual boot. Because Windows with a secured boot does not like you messing with the boot sector. Just putting it out there. Be warned if you're trying to do it. It can read pretty much every other operating system's file system. So right back from the old FAT32 for the Windows 95 and previous, all the way to Windows 10, uh, Windows NT. It can even read OS2 partitions. If anybody here remembers OS2, best operating system ever. That's totally serious. They did not survive, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But it's still around. Most bank machines are running it. But it'll read almost any operating system file systems. You can uh, read pretty much every file type that's out there. You can connect to pretty much any network that's out there. And there's tons of ways of running uh, Linux inside your computer. Um, you can use VirtualBox, VMware, uh, something called Lindos, which has actually been dead as a doorknob for a few years now, but people still download it and try to use it. Um, Wine, which is kind of a strange way of wording things, but yeah, you can you run Wine under Win32. Um, so it's gotten to the point where it's so compatible you can run Windows applications under Linux and you can run Linux applications under Windows. Uh, one of the recent, development, recent developments in Windows land is you can install Ubuntu right into Windows. Um, yeah, there's a little, you, you load up your Windows features, there's a checkbox you hit, then you drop the command line and you type in bash start or something and so the next thing you know it spends an hour downloading and you now have Ubuntu running inside of Windows. Literally, it shares the file system with Windows, but it's actually running full-on Ubuntu inside of Windows. No, 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 no. You can just open up a command prompt and go bash, and boop, you're in Linux land. And you can run Windows X Windows applications through it. It's full-on. Uh, right now, you can run Ubuntu, CentOS, Red Hat, and Fedora natively through Windows. And it runs side-by-side, -side, two kernels living side-by-side. -side. Uh, which lends a lot of credence to most of Windows is not Windows anymore. Um, Linux has superior networking capabilities. Another reason why people pick Linux. You have direct control of the networking stack. You can tweak it to make it do pretty much anything you want if you understand what you're doing. Um, it was designed as a networking operating system from the beginning. Thus, it's kept that inside itself. It is really powerful for networking. You can create routing rules where if you're accessing one website, you go down one pipe, and you want to access another website, you can go down a different pipe. 
And then you can go to the third website, go through the Tor network if you choose. There's tons of options, and it's insanely powerful. Um, it's cost effective. You can use old beat up equipment, it'll run. We actually have some old servers at work we're using as test beds for newer releases of our web apps. But we just don't need really good hardware to run it on. We're running it on servers that are 15 years old. And it's running a modern Linux distribution. Fine, it takes an extra minute and a half for each web page to load, but it's good enough to test. It runs on almost anything. Um, odds are most of you who have uh, fairly modern routers at home, they're running Linux. So anybody here with Bell 5, it's running Linux. I know for a fact, because I had a technician come to my house, hook up to their connect to the Bell 5 router, and they pulled it open the Linux command prompt while they fixed something that was broken on the inside. So it Linux is everywhere. Um, now, you guys took Computer Essentials, so hopefully you don't remember what a, the word partition means. You guys remember what a partition is? It's a division of a hard drive. You take a big room, you put up walls. Those are partitions. It has, at most, at minimum, two partitions. You can have as many partitions as you want. At minimum, there's two. There is slash, also known as the root partition. Same thing as your C drive in Windows. There's a swap partition. Although it is optional, it is strongly recommended you have a swap partition. Swap partition is used for swapping out memory. So programs load up, use up a lot of memory. It'll take the contents and shove them to the disk temporarily. It's for the programs you're not using. The same thing as the paging file in Windows. I don't know if you learned that in Computer Essentials, what a paging file is. But don't delete that file ever. In Linux, it's a partition. So it's a little bin that's set aside saying, OS, when you run out of space in your head, take some of the contents from your head, put it here for a while. When you're ready for it, we'll give it back to you. There are a few other partitions you can choose to create that are really common. Uh, slash boot. Uh, what's in the boot partition? The things the OS needs to turn on. A lot of people like having the boot partition separate so that if the OS shits the bed, you only need to worry about that partition to come back to life. Um, if you have lots of hard drives in your server, often people create other partitions such as the user partition. The user partition contains the user programs. The home partition is where your home folder is. For those of you in Windows land, it's the same thing as C colon backslash users. But it's called home. Um, the file system for most Linux operating systems Nowadays, is ext4. Um, the ext3 is still in use. The ext2 hopefully is dead and will stay dead forever. Uh, it was terrible. It was basically FAT32 for Linux. It, it didn't work very well. Uh, if there was a power blip, whoops, you lost some files. Congratulations. That was life. Um, there's actually other operating system, uh, other file systems out there that are becoming, picking up speed. Uh, Oracle's file system, believe it or not, is picking up speed for popularity. Uh, it's actually significantly pretty awesome. Uh, there's ZFS, which is also very good. Uh, but by default, you install Linux, odds are it's going to be an ext4 partition. The super user is known as root. So if you've ever seen some geek walk around going with a shirt that says, got root? That's what they're referring to. If you log in as the root user, you have full access to the whole OS. Unless a person's directory is encrypted, you can read anybody's files, do whatever you want, turn things on, turn things off, and completely erase things. And there's, it's not even going to ask you if you're sure you want to do it. Just go. The root user's home directory is different than all the others. There's a directory called slash root. That's the root user's home directory. You should not play in there unless you have to. Why? Because the system administrator will get angry. If it's your own computer, congratulations, you get to explore root to your heart's content. You shouldn't mess with it too much. If you had a good admin, you wouldn't be able to get into the root folder anyways. 
Unless he made everybody else root, which has been known to happen. Um, when you create a login as root, you can create another user, command called user add. You can change password using a command called passwd, while stands for password. You'll notice a lot of Linux commands are missing letters, but not all of them. It's just how it is. All right. Linux has a GUI, has many GUIs, as many, as many GUIs as there are people in this room. But a lot of people, especially administrators, prefer to drop to the command line. Why? Because there's nothing getting in the way. You can do some really cool stuff with the command line in Linux. And there's no barriers. A lot of people, once you get used to the command line in Linux, actually go back to the GUI and go, why the hell am I in here? Other than I need to look something up using a web browser. It runs on character-based terminals. Essentially, its text looks like a DOS prompt. The command line utilities are faster, normally, because why? Because there's no GUI being loaded, no GUI being rendered. There's no GUI. Therefore, it's one whole layer taken away from the process. Um, often, there's even come no com there's no GUI equivalent to a lot of the commands. Said, awk, all those kinds of commands, there's no GUI for them. So the cool tools have no equivalent because it'd be too complicated to write UI for it. Essentially, in Ubuntu, you can open up a terminal and I should actually instead of talking about it, but I should I just bring it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This should be an interesting experience. I haven't tried loading this VM on the school network yet. What's my password? All right, I'm typing nowhere. Yeah, I know. Believe it or not, I do know how to use a computer. Okay. All right. All right, this is Ubuntu 14. Yay. Like I said, it had like shades of brown and purple and orange. And there's a few ways of using it. There's, as it talks about in there, you can click on this thing and go terminal. And there's our terminal. Or you can also go straight to a pure command prompt using a different keystroke. No GUI getting in the way. This is as close to running on a server as you can get. I'm typing blind. And then there's our command prompt. So that's basically what you're going to be looking at in this class for the next, for the rest of this term is this screen. In one shape, form, or other. Um, Essentially, what I just did was this, or there's also a keyboard shortcut, control T. There's shortcuts for everything. Um, there's a few commands you should know. How to shut down your operating system. Command's called shutdown. Shutdown dash R now means reboot it now. H means halt the system when it powers off. And then you can say shut down in 10 minutes, plus 10. And it sends out a message warning everybody the system is going to turn off in 10 minutes. Uh, you can also do the graphical interface where you can click on a button and it turns off the computer for you just like it does in Windows. Okay. What is a shell? Like I said, this, these slides are full of text. I just got to get through the first, the first lecture, which is all terminology. What is a shell? A shell is a command line interpreter. For those of you that have lived in Windows land for years, have seen a DOS prompt, or those of you are running a more somewhat more modern version of Windows,
You've seen PowerShell. Same thing. Same idea. It looks almost the same. And my mouse is missing. So a shell can also be a programming language. This is where the Windows DOS prompt and the shell and the Linux command prompt differ dramatically. Linux has a variety of shells you can use, and they each have their own little programming language built in. So you know how in DOS, do you guys learn about batch files in your computer essentials class? And you had this horrible language that you wrote in, and it really didn't do a whole lot. Congratulations, the language is even more horrible, but it does a lot more. Uh, the syntax makes no sense. Uh, I imagine somebody took Java and ran it through a blender and then threw it up onto a desk. Um, no, really, wait till you see what a bash script file looks like and you'll understand exactly what I mean. An if statement is terminated by fi. If, fi. Flipped it, but it, only for the if statement. Um, so shells have their built-in programming language. You can create bash script files. You can do all kinds of things inside your bash script files. You can automate user creation. You can automate a lot of administrative tasks, all building up a couple of commands, and magic happens. Um, shells can be used interactively and non-interactively. Interactive mode means you can type stuff and stuff happens if you type it in right. Or you can execute non-interactively. It runs a script and stuff happens. In other words, just like running a batch file in Windows or on DOS. You run the command, stuff happens, and you go, you pray the right things happened. Bash is the most common uh, shell at this point in time. It's born again shell. Because originally it was a shell called born. SH. But then they was born again. There's really bad puns in Linux land. <laughs> it rose f after three days. That is not PC. <laughs> but anyways, basically put after a while, people realized SH was limited. It couldn't do everything they wanted to do. So they decided to take the guts, rip them out, put them in a new body, and it rose. It's basically a zombie, it's a zombie shell. And actually, I can't call it that because there's a shell called ZSH. Um, it can run on most Linux operating system, Unix-based operating system. It runs on top of Linux. You can now install it in Windows and run a Bash shell in Windows. It was released in 1989. Notice the date. That's before Linux. So the shell for Linux has existed longer than Linux has. Um, it's written in C, and the original guy was Brian Fox. Uh, it's open source, as everything else is. Uh, if you want to know what the available shells are in your operating system, you can type in these commands. Um, just make sure you understand what these commands do. Because we haven't talked about cat or any of that, so you know it's pointless telling you guys, go type this in. You don't even have it installed yet. Uh, however, there's a couple different things. There's built-in utilities. Uh, each shell has its own tools built into it. There's certain things they can do natively. Um, it does not create a new process when you execute the built-in programs. That means built-in utilities built into the shell run fast because it doesn't launch another program. So in Windows, you type in the word DIR, it actually runs a program called DIR. With a lot of these shells, commands such as LS, which is the same thing as DIR, is built into the shell. That means it doesn't launch another program to list the files. It just lists the files. It skips a step. Um, there's a help command for most bash commands. And you can run the help command and stuff happens. OK. I am not showing you how to recover your passwords um, because that could be like a 15-minute demonstration. Remember if after you've installed your Ubuntu install and you pooched your install and you can't remember your password? Slideshow 1 shows you how to do it. And the guy who prepared the slideshow was really nice for you guys. He put in screenshots <laughs> showing you how to do it. And by the way, this, if you can get physical access to any Ubuntu server, you can change the root password doing this. Yes, sir. 
It is security is fantastic until somebody touches your keyboard and is able to reboot your computer. Then security might as well not exist. Walk around no pants on. But Windows isn't much better. I have a tool for that. However, there are some basic Linux commands that are good to know right off the bat. Pass W, D, is change your password. It's good to know how to change your password. Who am I? In case you don't remember who you are. You laugh. Sometimes you know you're working and you change. As you can see, there's a command down here called switch users, SU. And you've SU'd a few times. Now you don't remember if you're in as your basic user, as a super user, or as some other user. Because you could log in as yourself, then you go SU into root, and then you SU into the Apache user because you need to run something like Apache. And next thing you know, you don't know who you are anymore. You go, who am I? Then it tells you who you are. Host name. What's the name of your computer? Believe it or not, that's actually something important to know. Uh, Uname. Uname tells you what operating system you're running. It tells you a bunch of things. All right, a few other basic commands. LS, I already said that. LS is the same thing as DIR in Windows. So when you learn Computer Essentials, and did they make you guys play in a DOS prompt in Computer Essentials? Yeah, kind of. Every, every, I've been told every year they pay less and less attention to the command prompt. Just like, a, like 10 minutes, right? Oh, okay, good. So you know what DIR is. This ls is the same thing as dr, list files. Uh, cd, same thing as dos, change directory. You give it a path. pwd, present working directory. You want to know where you are. We had a command earlier that told you who you are. pwd tells you where you are. mkdir makes a directory. There's ways of creating recursive directory structures, parent and child, so you can create a multi-depth directory structure in one command. That's something Windows can't do. RMDIR. What do you think that does? It removes the directory. But most of the commands are self-explanatory. You just have to remember what it's called. More. Less is more. Essentially, you need to know the contents of a file or you need to have a long directory listing and you need to know how to, you want to put pauses so you can read. Because, you know, it's not like a hacking movie where the guy types in a command and text goes blurring by and he knows exactly what he needs to type in next, you know. And I hate movies where they have hacking because it's the worst thing ever. For me, that's an immersion breaker. So LS, and if the ETC directory is huge, there's lots of files inside of that. And if I were to go, nothing yet, because I didn't click on the damn window. All right, tons of stuff came up. That were you able to read what appeared at the top of that screen? Let's do that again. Oh, did you catch it that time? No. And right now, that's right off the screen. That's not helping anybody's learning experience. And now I don't have a mouse because I'm in here. There we go. What you'll see right here, this vertical bar is known as a pipe. And it's later in this term, we're going to learn about uh, what they call redirecting output. Pipe means Take the ls command, take the results of the ls command, and pipe it into this other program. Just here, take the results. So it's almost as if I told you to write a note, and then you give it to her to read it to me. And this goes. Now we can see the top. There's a more prompt. And we can keep paging through all those pages of text. That's what more does. Uh, if you need help, there's a command called man, the most useless help manual ever. 
It's great. Every piece of documentation you'd ever need for command line Linux is in, in man. You go man, give it some commands, some options, and then give it the command you're trying to find out. So if, for example, if you go man space ls, it gives you every possible option that you can feed into ls. Pages and pages and pages of command line arguments. And then you get tired of that and you go open up a web browser and you go to, to Google and you type in ls command line arguments. And then you get a Stack, a stack Overflow article that shows you how to use it properly. Uh, but man, if ever you're stuck in a dark room with no internet and all you have is Linux, at least you can pull up a man page. Um, info. Slightly less formal than man. That means that essentially you can type in info, it gives you a summarized version of what's inside of the man page. Man pages follow a very specific format. Every man page has the exact same layout and everything. Info, on the other hand, is whatever the author of the application wanted to use, they just put it in that. So it's kind of loose and free. Often you'll find the answer to what you're after much faster using info than man. But man will give you the instructions for every single argument. All right. Now, since you guys have already been through Opera, your first computer essentials, you should know the difference between an absolute path and a relative path. Okay. An absolute path is the full path. For example, my full path to the back of the room is up those stairs. I'm at the root. You guys are the directory structure. I want to get to back there. The full path is from me to there. Essentially, no matter where I'd be in the room, I could say this is the path out the door. It's a complete path. You always start from the root directory, literally like from root, and you type in the whole path. That's an absolute path. It'll work no matter where you're at. The relative path, on the other hand, is it's a path that is relative to your current position. In other words, the path to the exit. If I said somebody there, what's your relative path to the exit? You can say, well, it's right behind me. Just, you know, three steps up. On the other hand, somebody over here would say, well, no, I got to go over one, up a little bit, around the corner, and then out the door. It's a relative. It's relative to your current position. In other words, um, you can use uh, special characters to tell it, go up and start working up a directory, down a directory from here. But it always assumes when it's a relative path is it works from your current position. So you type in a command using a relative path, it assumes your current position, not the absolute path, which is the exact, the complete, whatever it is. You just got to be careful when you use it that you're using the one you know you're supposed to use. Now, when we still talk about paths, there are two special paths, dot and dot dot. Dot means current directory. Dot dot means parent directory. So for example, I'm talking to you about exiting the door. And you don't know what the path is to the door unless you come down one level. Then you can see the path to the door. Because right now where you're sitting, you can't see the exit. And a couple of examples. If you do, for example, make directory test, it'll create a directory right where you're at called test. However, if you wanted it somewhere else, but you don't want to change to that directory, you type, type in the whole path, the absolute path. So home user one test, as opposed to make test, it would be right there. Okay, absolute path versus relative path. It shows a few examples. The slides are self-explanatory. And here's they show a, a directory structure. And assuming that the top is a root directory, you got all the basic directories you'd find. Current directories here. If you were talking about the relative path, it means from here down. The absolute path means you're going to supply the path from all the way up first. So you're giving absolute addresses, not relative addresses for where files are. And trying to find a, a world, real-world example of that is a little challenging. Um, 
J okay, who here sucks at directions? Okay. Are you one of the kinds of people that you don't know exactly where you are when you're driving around, so you'd rather drive an extra five minutes to go back to where you know for a fact how to get to somewhere, as opposed to, oh, I'm going west from here. I'll take the next left and hope that gets me there. So if you're one of the kinds of people that drive all the way back to your starting point so you know where how to get to the mall from where you were before, you're using absolute paths. If you happen to know, you know, from where you are going down that way, you're using a relative path, as in you're starting from your current position moving on, whereas a, an absolute path is you're going right to the core base and moving from there. I can guarantee this concept is going to trip up so many of you during the labs. Just saying. So remember earlier I talked about there's a command called PWD, Present Working Directory, and also known as where the hell am I? Where the hell am I command will help you find you where you are so that you know what the absolute path is because it's really small, but you can see my present working directory slash home slash Daniel G. The command prompt shows Daniel G at Ubuntu, so that's my user. That's just you know, my current directory at the name of the machine. My machine's called Ubuntu. Oof, I'm original. Actually, that's the default name. Um, but that's what, that's how you find your relative path. I could go, wow, that's totally not readable. Yeah, that's what I'll have to do. I've got to change my shell colors. Oh, I would, but I'm in a command prompt, no mouse. <laughs> um, I'm going to make a directory called test. Then go to test. And now I'm in test. As you saw, I didn't give a path in front, so I created a directory right at my current position. This is actually probably out of everything I talked about today, remembering the difference between an absolute path and the relative path is probably the most important part of today's lesson. It is just knowing where you are in the operating system and how to get to where you're supposed to be are the two most important things. And according to my slideshow count, that's the end of the slideshow. The first lecture is basically giving you guys background information. Going forward, um, we're going to start talking about all the different command line tools. Oh, I get to pick on you now. Um, but going forward, um, like next week, I'll be showing you guys a demonstration of all the different commands that are listed inside the slideshow. Instead of going through the slideshow slide by slide, um, I'll show you guys the arguments, the behavior. I will try to make my font bigger. Um, and I'll be recording all these commands. Uh, your lab this week is to install VMware, which you get for free. I don't care if you use VMware 12, VMware 14. I honestly don't care which one you use. Uh, if you want to use VirtualBox, knock yourself out, although some of the tasks will be slightly harder because VirtualBox's commands aren't quite the same. Uh, I've had a few students say, well, I'm running Linux on my computer already. Good for you. Uh, you will be learning certain commands that may damage your install. And you may have suddenly have a Linux no longer functioning for you if you screw up. Therefore, Yes, if you just want to use your current install, knock yourself out. Hope you're good at figuring out how to fix your OS. Uh, one of the perks of using something like VMware is you can create backups of your, your OS by copying a file. And VMware has built-in tools for creating backups by clicking a few menu options. Um, so if you want to keep Using the Linux you have installed in your machine, knock yourself out. I honestly don't care. If you nuke your OS, I'll be going, ha, <laughs> um, not my problem. Because you were told to install VMware and run it in a VM. Um, the good news is you get VMware for free for one year. Yeah, VMware Workstation Pro. It's hella expensive, but you get it for free. 
Um, but my company won't even pay for it. <laughs> so it gives it, I think it's about 500 bucks a seat for the pro version that you guys get access for free. There's version in 12 and 14. Uh, you get it in your uh, software, you know, your digital resources portal under software, under VMware. And Mac users, you can get VMware Fusion. Or parallels. Yeah. But that's a choice you have. So whichever one you want to use, knock yourself out. It's the same. Uh, but essentially, the way the labs are going to work, just to finish off this little bit, is you submit your labs. I grade it. If you want to show it to me in class, that's fine. The Linux labs do take longer to grade than the database labs. Just putting it out there. And those that had me for lab for database know how fast I grade labs. Uh, usually it's about three seconds a student. Um, I'm not Cheryl. <laughs> um, but that have been said, these ones are longer to grade. Uh, there are definitely more steps involved. There are quizzes on Blackboard. Actually, let me go pull that up for you guys. Okay, for everybody's enjoyment, you got the usual array of tools on the left. They ignore everything that says below course management, you guys don't have those tools. Those are mine. Course information has the CSI and the course outline. Student tools, which is hidden from you guys because <coughs> most of them are useless and I provided shortcuts to the ones that are useful. Digital resources, you guys know what that's for, it's where you go download your stuff. My grades, in case you care. Email and calendar. Uh, Self-explanatory. I have made sure that all the important dates are on the calendar. So at least check calendar once in a while to make sure things are all good. Lectures is where you're going to find all the slideshows. Maybe. There they are. There's all the slideshows. Labs. Here are all your labs. They're set up as quizzes. You type in your answers. It doesn't grade them automatically. I don't, as far as I know, they don't grade them automatically. It just submits it so I don't need to deal with weird formatting. For those that insist on using MacWrite, whatever the hell it's called now, or OpenOffice, or LibreOffice, or Insert Operating, or or whatever you will choose to use, I don't have to deal with different weird file formats. It all comes in a nice format, I just scroll, 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 and go, ah, oh, congratulations, you win. Or not. Um, the last three labs are actually sub file submissions, uh, almost like assignments, because well, when you go to download those labs, you'll understand. They're all quizzes. You literally, they're quizzes as in you type in the answers to what you're doing. Lab one, lecture one. And if you look at it, you'll see this here. It'll go exercise one, command PWD, read the man page. What is the purpose of the command? Type it in there. Record the bash prompt. What's basically type in what goes into that box. Oh, no, no, these aren't quiz. They're not timed quizzes. Uh, uh, it actually saves automatically. It does save automatically as it goes. Um, some people may choose to just put everything in a in a text document and then copy paste the shit in at the end. Pardon the language. Um, there's ways of doing it. I've been using Blackboard for years, and a lot of people complain about Blackboard. Trust me, what's coming next fall is going to suck harder. Uh, I've used both the ones they're demoing, and they both suck harder than Blackboard does, at least from a teacher's perspective. 
Uh, I don't know from the student perspective, they're both hosted. We're not, it's not being run in-house, it's being hosted. Which means that you're at the whim of their hosting service. Which is not just, it's just as bad. Um, but that's the format of most of the labs. Like I said, you guys can probably sit there and plow through most of these in a weekend. So, you know, yes. No. And I'll grade them and then I'll type in a number. Yeah, you go begin and then there's, each question has the instructions. Yeah. No, you can take your time, but most of these you probably want to go from this top and work your way down. Yeah. But a lot of this stuff, because you're working through a VM, you can't copy paste. Into Word. If you choose to, you can. It's your choice. It's whatever you want to do. But that's essentially it. Um, other than that, I'll see you guys at lab. The labs are from 4 to 6 and 6 to 8. Uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays. No, no, you have to do it. You can do it and you start at class. During the class. Yeah, lab one has not been assigned yet. You don't have to finish it by the end of the class. You got a week to do it. Each lab has a week to do. They don't take a week. I did lab one today in 14 minutes. But my computer is really fast. So, other than that, uh, I'll see you guys at lab tomorrow.